All right, let's go ahead and begin. So, by a raise of hands, who was up late working on uh, water gems? A few people? Some of you maybe were up early working on water gems? Yeah. All right, so uh, you've uploaded the two maps of your network under the no flow and design flow condition. I'm going to take a look at those and give you feedback over the coming days, and then uh, you'll have over the break to work on the third phase of the project. And so I'll give you a little more information about the third phase of the project in class on Thursday. Um, if we look into the immediate future, you actually don't have something to turn in on Thursday. I don't know if you noticed that, but it's a rare gap in the schedule. Uh, nothing on Thursday, and then you've got all of next week off, too. Uh, but after that, the break is over. You've got an assignment on Tuesday, the 2nd of April, and then we're having an exam on Thursday. Um, so this exam number two is going to cover open channel flow uh, with the addition of a question where you're going to have the chance to demonstrate your newfound expertise in water gems. All right. Now, um, program crashes, you just got to make sure that you can start the program and do modeling. Um, if, if suddenly the program crashes, I, I uh, I used to be okay with tech support on water gems in version 8. Like I'd seen enough of the error messages that I kind of knew what they were related to, but version 10 is a whole different set of error messages I haven't seen before. So I'm not going to be able to help you with some unique issue that pops up because you've got XYZ video card or whatever. Um, so the way to make sure that you're able to uh, do what you need to on the exam day is just ensure that water gems is operational and I mean, if you can load your model and have it calculate the pressures uh, on the laptop that you'll use in the exam, then uh, you should be good to go for the test. So I'll give you a little more information about the exam as it approaches, but are there any questions so far? Yes? I haven't written the question yet. It's just going to be uh, a question where you need to be able to use water gems. Yeah? Hmm. Um, no, because I provide a pretty detailed equation sheet. I, you know that four page long one that you've used in the past? I think that it has all the formulas that you'll need for the exam. Yeah. Are there other questions? All right. So today we're going to continue talking about um, non-uniform flow. When we have uniform flow, and we want to know how deep the water is going to be based on a certain flow rate, what equation do we use if we know it's uniform? What is it? Manning's equation. Right. So Manning's equation is like this perfect world where the water never gets disturbed and there's no changes in the channel. Um, but everything else, we need a whole different set of tools. And specific energy is the first way of looking at things that we've been using as a way to understand what happens when there are drops and steps in the flow. So we're going to continue with those calculations today. Just as a reminder, what we looked at was that gradually increasing step where we got to a certain threshold that was the maximum critical step height. And that happened to be the step height in which we observed critical flow because uh, that's the least amount of energy required to convey a certain flow rate. You can think of critical flow as being very efficient because you're getting the cue through the channel with the least amount of energy. And least amount of energy is important because if you can compare location one and location two, we can do an energy balance. And what we say is that the energy that was available at one to push the flow up over that obstacle, well, there's the same amount of specific energy available at two, except for that you need to subtract the energy associated with that step up. And so there's only going to be a certain amount of flow above the step at two, uh, a certain amount of energy in the flow above that step. And so the, uh, the minimum energy is associated with the uh, critical depth. And remember, I told you that uh, kind of shortcut rule of thumb that when you have critical flow in a rectangular channel, the flow depth, y sub c, 
is two-thirds of the specific energy. The other one-third is in the velocity head. <coughs> OK. So now what's the story with this picture? Well, what you can see is that there's a before and an after that's being shown here. The before is the Y1. That dashed line shows where the water level was before we had the step too big. This delta ZD, that's a bigger step than the critical step height. That's the limit step height that can occur without choking a flow. And so there wasn't enough energy before we put that step in. This E1, the initial amount of energy that there was upstream, wasn't sufficient to push the flow up over that obstruction. And so what happened was, temporarily, flow conditions became unsteady. Uh, unsteady, remember, <coughs> means that flow conditions are changing with respect to time. So there's more flow going in if we were going to draw a control volume. There's more flow going in than there is out temporarily. And so if there's more in than out, that means there's an accumulation and the water level is going to rise. So the water level is rising so that the energy that's present at one can gradually increase until it comes into that perfect equilibrium again where there's just now barely enough energy to push the water over this obstruction. And again, the flow will occur at the critical depth, which is associated with the minimum specific energy. All right, so that's kind of a whole chain of events. I explained it on Thursday. I've just gone over another overview today. I sometimes think it's really important for you to be able to uh, take an image and explain the concepts in terms of uh, you know, the story behind the image there. So that's a, a good way to know if you understand what's happening uh, with choking, is if you could make sense of each of these and not just define them, but tell a cohesive narrative as though you were explaining it to someone who really had no idea what's going on in the figure. This is the specific energy diagram. On the horizontal axis is the specific energy. On the vertical axis is the depth. And what we saw was that every time we kept making the step a little bit higher, it's reducing the amount of energy that's available at the downstream location, too, until we got to that maximum step height, delta Z, C. And then when we went beyond it, we're off the specific energy diagram. That means that there's no longer any depth that the water can flow at with that much specific energy. And so there needs to be a different amount of specific energy to make it up over that step. All right, uh, just to refresh how we do the calculations on a problem like this, let's consider the, uh, the flow conditions at a couple of different locations. Now, upstream, Flow conditions are such that we've got this rectangular channel. You can see the width is 2.5 meters. Our initial flow depth is 0.9 meters. And we know the flow rate. So with this information, we can calculate what's the velocity. We can calculate how much specific energy there is. Basically, all the parameters we need to know in order to find out how high can this step be before choking just barely starts to occur. Now, I've outlined for you the steps that you can solve this using. First of all, find the uh, velocity at 1 at this upstream location. Then uh, find the Froude number, the amount of specific energy. And then the understanding is that you're going to have the same amount of specific energy at 2, except for that there's going to be that loss in energy uh, related to the delta Z. So what we can say is uh, E2 is E1 minus delta Z. All right, so the process I'm saying is find the velocity, the Froude number. Does anybody remember why we uh, classify the flow regime in finding the Froude number? Why do we care what the Froude number is? It's, uh, it'll tell you if the flow conditions are subcritical or supercritical, and we use it uh, once we solve that cubic equation to know which route to select. Right, OK, so find the velocity, diagnose the flow regime before, find how much energy there was 
at 1. And we can think of 1 as either before or upstream. Uh, by before, what I mean is what if we dropped this step in suddenly? Then what would happen uh, with the flow over that step? So you find the energy at 1, and then the energy at 2 is the energy at 1 minus the delta z. And so what we're trying to assess here is, first of all, what would be the flow depth if the delta z is 0.05 meters? And then secondly, how high can we take that delta z before choking occurs? So that means um, if you say that, OK, so part A, what you're doing in part A is basically find y2. Now, um, in this second question, what's the maximum obstruction? So in part B, let E2 be the E minimum. So what delta Z goes along with that? All right. So I'm going to pause for a moment, give you some time to calculate these things. Here's another way of calculating the Froude number, by the way. Uh, there are a couple of different um, you know, equations for it. If we have a rectangular channel and the hydraulic depth is equal to the physical depth, then you can calculate it this way. All right. Um, so if we start with the preliminaries, you'll find that the velocity at 1 is 1.889 meters per second. And it's important that you not just round that down to 1.8. With all the things that we're going to be doing with the numbers, you know, finding the cubic roots and squaring things uh, in the velocity head, it's best to keep as much precision as possible inside the calculator. Um, so when you use that velocity at 1 to find the Froude number, you should get that the Froude number is 0 0.636. And since that's less than 1, that means that the uh, flow conditions are subcritical. That's going to help us to know uh, which route to select. Um, so to find the energy that's available at 2, then we have to find the energy at 1 minus the delta z. So the energy at 1 is the depth and the velocity head at 1. And then we're going to subtract out the 0.05 meters of the step height. Why subtract instead of plus the delta z? Because it's a step up, and the water's losing energy as it steps up. So that energy is being transferred from specific energy into potential energy because the delta z is not included in specific energy. So that's why it's the minus. If it was a step down, it would have been plus. All right, so the energy at 2 is 1.0319 meters. And we know that that's going to be distributed in two places. That specific energy, part of it will be in the depth, y2. Part of it will be in the velocity head. And uh, since I don't know the velocity at 2, but I do know the flow rate that's going through the channel, I choose to write the uh, velocity head in terms of q squared divided by 2ga squared. And the nice thing about that is that the unknown depth goes into the uh, cross-sectional area term. All right, so in the end, we set up the cubic equation and solve for the three roots. There's one that's negative we can eliminate. And then there's the uh, depth of 0.557 meters. And that would be the depth that's associated with supercritical flow. And then the uh, alternate depth is 0 0.804 meters. And that's the one that we choose because that's the one that's associated with subcritical flow at 2. And since we had subcritical flow at 1, then this will be the flow depth at 2 when we've got the step up of 0 0.05 meters. So does everybody understand that process? Now, let's look at calculating the uh, maximum step height. You know, how high could we take things? Um, and what are the implications of that? Wait for the TV to warm up here. We can use the uh, flow per unit width to find the critical depth. Because remember, what we know is that um, when the, uh, the maximum step height occurs, 
that's the, uh, the step height that's going to cause critical flow just above it. So um, in the preliminaries here at the beginning, what I'm doing is I'm calculating what is the critical depth. Um, the delta Z max means that essentially we're setting the flow depth at location 2 to be equal to the critical depth. Remember the, the stuff I told you about it being the most efficient depth? It's like the last depth that can accommodate the flow before choking because it's most efficient. All right, so I found the flow per unit width of 1.7 meters squared per second. That's big Q divided by B, the channel width. Uh, so from that, we get the critical depth, 0.665 meters. And then what is the velocity when we have that critical depth? So 2.555 meters per second. So the uh, energy equation is going to look like we've got the energy at 1, which is the original flow conditions. And then we have the uh, uh, minimum specific energy at 2 plus some delta Z max. I didn't necessarily even have to calculate the velocity head. I could have just said this depth of 0.665 times 3 halves, and that would have given me the same thing as adding in the velocity head. But for this time, I calculated the velocity head. So it tells me that the maximum step height that can be tolerated before there's choking is 0 0.084 meters. And anything greater than that, and we're going to exceed the amount of uh, specific energy that's uh, required at 2 to accommodate the flow, and so then choking would be begin. So this is the limit of the step height. And anything more than that, and uh, we'd have to go through a different process, which I'm going to outline in just a moment. Um, any questions about these calculations? So in the second, this part B, we knew the depth, and we're solving for the delta Z. You know, there can really only be one unknown in the specific energy equation. We can, we can either solve it for the depth or we can solve it for the maximum step height. When we're solving for the maximum step height, we're saying we, we know the depth. It's going to be the critical depth. That's, by definition, the maximum step height is the height that occurs when the critical depth is going over it. So that's why we set that y2 equal to yc. All right, so choked flow is when uh, the maximum constriction has caused critical flow at the, uh, at the channel, and then we go a little bit further. We exceed that maximum constriction. So the water upstream begins to increase. The depth will submerge upstream hydraulic structures, potentially. So uh, what that means is that if you, have, if you cause pooling, then the water levels are going to be getting deeper. And so that could uh, cause any culverts or bridges to behave differently than they ordinarily do. And it could cause property to flood. And so it's something we need to uh, be on the lookout for, this choking. It can be dangerous. All right. Um, let me tell you about the process that you should follow in order to find the new upstream depth. And let's start with, initially, the water is flowing through some channel. And the beginning depth was 10 feet before we did anything. This was just kind of the uh, starting flow depth. But then we put in an obstruction. And the obstruction height is also 10 feet. Well, obviously, that's going to be too high, even without the calculations to support it. We already know that the, uh, the maximum delta z has got to be less than the flow depth. And so what's going to happen is that the water is going to start to pool upstream until there's enough energy to get the water over this at the critical depth. Now, will there be flow before it gets to critical depth? Yeah. Um, during this period of unsteady flow, what will happen is that at first there will just be a trickle, like when the, the depth upstream is 10.1 feet maybe a trickle of water will be going over the obstruction. But the flow in to this control volume will still be greater than the flow out. 
then the water depth gets to 10.2 feet. And that trickle is a little bit more than it was before. And so there's a bigger, uh, there's less of a difference between the inflow and the outflow. But it'll take some time until finally the water that's entering this control area, is, uh, control volume, the inflow and the outflow are equal. And when it finally goes back to steady flow conditions, it's going to be non-uniform. You can see just by looking it's non-uniform. But when it's steady again, you'll have the critical depth going over the obstruction. And so the question is, how tall does the water have to be upstream after pooling? So Y prime 1 means upstream depth after choking. So here's the process. First of all, you find out how much energy is required to make the water flow over the obstacle. And so the required energy is the minimum specific energy, which again is 3 halves times the critical depth. So you can calculate the critical depth for uh, flow through a rectangular channel. The critical depth is related to the flow per unit width. Let me write that formula here on the whiteboard just so we've got it handy in this example. Remember that y sub c is lowercase q squared divided by g to the one-third power, and that's only for rectangular. If you've got trapezoidal flow uh, channel geometry, then calculating the critical depth is a little bit more involved. We can still do it, but it's just not as easy as this. All right, so the process is, first of all, find out how much energy do you need to get the water over this obstruction. So it's going to be 10 feet plus the minimum specific energy for this flow rate. Next, you ask the question, is there enough energy at 1 to satisfy what's required? So we're looking at available versus required. If available is less than required, then pooling will occur until available equals required. Um, if available is greater than the requirement to begin with, then there won't be any need for pooling. The water will just go over the obstruction at some other depth. Now, uh, if choking is going to happen, then what you're going to do is you're going to solve for y prime 1 uh, for the required energy. And you know, E required is going to have two components. E is depth and velocity head. So Y squared divided by 2GA squared. And remember, so it's going to be Y plus Q squared divided by 2GYB squared. So what we're saying is Y prime 1, Y prime 1. So the, uh, the depth after pooling. All right, so let's, uh, let's consider this for the uh, flow rate is 500 CFS. The uh, channel width is 10. And the initial uh, depth is 10 feet. So this is one where I said, yes, it's definitely going to uh, start choking the flow. There's going to be pooling upstream. So let me go through and do some of these calculations. Uh, to find the critical depth, first of all, we've got um, 500 CFS going through 10 feet wide channel. You notice the B, the, the channel width is 10 feet. And so the uh, flow per unit width is 10 square feet uh, per second. So we square that divided by G for traditional units is 32.2 feet per second squared. And then that's all to the one third power. So the critical depth is going to be 4.265 feet. Now let's uh, ask ourselves, how can we find out the minimum specific energy? Because we're, we're trying to calculate the required energy as our first thing. So the uh, minimum specific energy is going to be 3 halves of the critical depth. So E min is 3 halves times Y sub C. All right, so 3 halves times um, 4.265 feet. 
So the minimum amount of energy that's required to get the flow over that obstruction is 6.398 feet. Um, that's the minimum specific energy required. We also have to have the delta Z. So then the total energy, total energy required is going to be the uh, 6.398 feet plus 10 feet of the obstruction. So it's 16.398 feet. Okay, so that's the energy required. That's how much has to be at one in order for the water to go over the obstruction without choking. So let's check available energy. How much energy is initially available? So the available energy is going to be Y1 plus flow per unit width squared divided by 2G Y1 squared. This is another way to write the uh, velocity head. Okay, so it's 10 feet of depth plus the uh, velocity head. So it's 50 feet squared per second. That's the uh, flow per unit width squared divided by 2 times 32.2 feet per second squared. And then the uh, y1 squared, so 10 feet, square that. So unfortunately, the amount of energy that's in the velocity head is only 0.388 feet. There's very little energy in the velocity head at 1. So that means that the total energy available, so I'm going to say E available, is only 10.388 feet. Okay, I'll circle that. E available is 10.388. Uh, e required was 16. What does that tell us about what's going to happen? Choking will occur. All right. So choking will occur until the available energy builds up to have enough to meet the requirement. So the depth at one is going to get deeper and deeper and deeper until the uh, new upstream depth provides that requirement. All right, and now from here it is the uh, pretty familiar process of just setting some known amount of energy equal to an unknown depth. So we say there's going to be some new upstream depth. It's y prime 1. And then there's also going to be the velocity head. So the energy that's required is that 16.398. And it's going to consist of the depth and the velocity head. So we're solving for the new depth. And go through the process of rearranging it in terms of a cubic equation. And there will be three roots. And um, we didn't calculate the Froud number, but we know that the flow conditions are subcritical because uh, the flow was choked. Y1 is greater than the critical depth. You'll remember that we did calculate the critical depth was 4.2. So we know that the, uh, the flow conditions at 1 are going to be greater than that critical depth. And so it's, it's uh, the subcritical root of the three choices that we choose. We throw out the negative one. We can ignore the supercritical root because um, the flow depth is going to be greater than the critical depth. So I think the new thing that uh, you've kind of picked up in this slide, I mean, a lot of the calculation skills are the same. But the new thing is comparing required and available and knowing that 
if the required is less than the available, then that means that choking will occur and the amount of energy upstream will build until required is equal to available. So that means that the, uh, the flow depth just increases until you meet that requirement to get the water over the choke. Any questions about that? Yeah. It will uh, it will stay um, if if this obstruction stays in place and the flow rate stays the same, then it'll continue to flow at the critical depth, and uh, this y prime one will stay stable, and once it reaches equilibrium, it, it will stay in equilibrium unless some other thing takes it out, like a change in the flow rate or an adjustment to what's in the channel upstream or downstream. Are there other questions? Um, let me remind myself. All right. All right, so you've seen me work through the uh, the process on this example. Um, let's have you check and see if it will choke. Now we've got the same 500 CFS. So a lot of these calculations are going to stay the same. For example, the critical depth is still going to be 4.265 feet because we've got this same 500 CFS going through a 10 foot wide channel. It's just we changed the step. The, uh, this extreme example was what if we put in a 10 foot obstruction height. Now, what if it's just a 3 foot obstruction height? The question is, um, is it going to choke because of that obstruction? So what you need to do is uh, find out how much energy is there initially at 1. And in fact, I think we uh, maybe already found that, the available energy at 1. So E available at 1 is 10.388 feet. So let's step through the logic here. If we have 10.388 feet at 1, the question is how much energy is required at 2? That is maybe going to be something new, because uh, we don't necessarily know what is the flow depth, and we don't know what is going to be the, uh, the uh, velocity headed to, but we can calculate that with the uh, cubic equation approach. So let me clear off some of this whiteboard here. Uh, okay, E available is 10.388 feet. E1 is 10.388 feet. So what is Y2? And remember that uh, E2 is E1 minus delta Z. So once you find out how much there is at 2, then what you can say is that the uh, E2 consists of the depth, uh, Y2, plus Q squared divided by 2G A squared. So what is Y2? Okay, in the previous example, we calculated the E minimum. So we found out that based on the, um, the critical depth, there has to be at least 6.398 feet of specific energy 
in order to there to be enough energy to cause the critical flow over the obstruction. So uh, if we ask how much is available after the uh, water goes over the choke, it is, um, all right, this 7.338 like, sorry, uh, 7.388, that is the uh, initial amount of energy that was at 1 minus the 3 feet of the obstruction height. So after the water gets up over the obstruction, it has about 7.4 feet of energy. And that's more than the minimum. So that means that we've got more than enough energy, and it's not going to cause the critical flow over the obstruction. Do you have a question? You go on either the Froude number or comparing the uh, depth at 1 to the critical depth. So either one of those can tell you whether the conditions were supercritical or subcritical before the obstruction. And uh, in our case, we uh, already, I guess, in the previous example, looked at that this flow depth of 10 feet is more than the critical depth of 4.3. And so conditions at 1 are subcritical, then that means that the conditions at two are going to be subcritical as well. Okay, so this one's a little more tricky. What we wanted to do is we wanted to say, how much energy is there at one? That same amount of energy is going to be there at two minus the step up. So here's the energy at one, 10.388 feet. We take away three feet, so how much energy is there on top of the obstruction? So 7.388 feet. And then that energy is going to be split between the depth and the velocity head. And we write the velocity head in terms of the unknown depth. So that is uh, here, where we had 500 squared in the denominator, 2 times 32.2, and then 10y squared, so that's going to be 100 down there. And so solve for the roots, and we pick the, uh, the subcritical root. Now, the second part of the question was uh, the maximum allowable obstruction before choking. So the maximum allowable obstruction, remember, that's that last delta z height that has just caused the critical flow over the obstruction. So what we do for part B is we set the flow conditions so that we see the, um, the critical depth. Um, the initially available amount of energy at 1 was 10.388 feet. And we say the, uh, the maximum allowable step height is the one that causes critical flow over the obstruction. So the, the total amount of specific energy above the obstruction will be 3 halves of that critical depth. So that means there's going to be 6.398 feet of the energy allocated to the, the minimum. And so then the delta Z max will just be the difference between the two. So we could make the step as high as 3.99 feet, but any higher than that, and there won't be enough available to satisfy the required. We can have obstructions that are steps up in the bottom of the channel, or we can obstruct, obstruct a channel by uh, changing the width. And this is an example of a, a channel that's been artificially narrowed because of the piers that are put in. You can see that this bridge is supported by a couple of piers that go into the river. And um, the effect of those piers, they maybe are a couple feet wide in each case. And that reduces the cross-sectional area that the water is able to flow through. So this is another kind of obstruction. It's effectively what it's doing is it's making the channel narrower than it was before as the water goes through that section. And the interesting question is, when you make the channel narrower, is it going to cause the water level to rise 
or is it going to cause the water level to fall? And I think uh, probably most people have the initial reaction that you know, you're thinking in terms of uh, maybe the continuity equation. You're thinking, well, if the channel is narrower, then that must push the flow higher. And I mean, that's a natural reflex. But uh, the fact is that actually um, whether the water level gets higher or lower depends on whether the flow conditions are subcritical or supercritical. Because it's not just as simple as uh, the water maintaining the same velocity as it goes through that obstruction. The velocity will change, um, and then the depth effect is going to be due to both the reduction in the cross-sectional area and the velocity change. So we don't really know whether the water level will rise or fall until we do the calculations. Um, so we've already talked about the type of constriction where the bottom of the channel is raised. And if we think about it, in the term of specific energy and the flow per unit width. So remember, lowercase q, lowercase q is big Q divided by B. And so flow per unit width is the flow divided by the channel width. So when we raise the bottom of the channel, we're not doing anything to the channel width. So therefore, we're not changing the flow per unit width but we decrease the amount of specific energy there is at the downstream location where the bottom of the channel is raised. So from before, what we saw is that the amount of specific energy was less after having a step up. But um, if you decrease the width of the channel, either by putting in piers or you actually physically narrow the channel down, what happens is you have the same Q so the same overall flow rate, but now the width of the channel is less than it was before. So that means that it pushes the flow per unit width up, but we didn't do anything to the bottom of the channel. And so the amount of specific energy stays the same. Uh, now, meandering channels, like these natural channels, have a lot of situations where the width of the channel may decrease and it can be related to uh, different types of material that the water is flowing through. You know, it could be a transition from a, a marshy area to uh, a material that has less roughness. It can be caused to change in slopes. There are a lot of things that can cause the, the width of the channel to uh, change. And the behavior, like what's happening in terms of the flow depth is governed by the upstream behavior. And so we have to compare the energy equation upstream and downstream to know. And the uh, rule that we apply is if you have subcritical flow upstream of the constriction, then it's going to stay subcritical. But if you have supercritical flow upstream of the constriction, then the flow will stay supercritical again. Um, Let's consider the case of a couple of piers that are being put into a channel like this. So we have a rectangular channel, 2.5 meters wide, 0.9 meters deep, and we're sending a flow rate of 2.25 cubic meters per second through there. Now, If we build a bridge over the channel and we put in these circular piers that each have a width of 0.25 meters, then what you can see is that the effective flow uh, width has decreased from 2.5, and now it's down to 2. So we don't have as much channel width B as we had initially. So the question is, how is the water going to behave? How is it going to react in a situation like that? Um, we're going to say that the specific energy stays the same. So that's kind of the... Uh, the first thing is that E1 equals E2, because there's no step and there's no st step up or step down. The specific energy stays the same. And uh, let's calculate the flow per unit width, because we're probably going to need that. Um, the flow per unit width initially, lowercase q, is 2.25 divided by 2.5 meters. So that's 2.25 cubic meters per second. Anybody uh, have their calculator handy? Tell me what that is. 2.25 divided by 
0 0.9. All right. So then uh, y sub c is lowercase q squared divided by g to the one third power. Okay, so it's 0 0.9 meters squared per second. We square that, divide by 9.81 meters per second squared, and all of that's to the one third power. Okay, so the critical depth is 0 0.46, excuse me, 436. Um, energy 1 is equal to energy at 2. What that means is that it's going to be the depth y1 plus v1 squared divided by 2g is equal to y2 plus v2 squared divided by 2g. Um, we can calculate the velocity at 1. v1 is just going to be the flow rate divided by the cross-sectional area at 1. So 2.25 cubic meters per second divided by 2.5 meters multiplied by 0 0.9 meters. So it's 1 meter per second is the velocity at 1. And the, uh, the resulting energy at 1 is going to be uh, 0 0.9 meters plus 1 meter per second. That squared divided by 2 times 9.81 meters per second squared. Okay, so the E1 is 0 0.951 meters. And that's going to be available also at location 2. So now we're going to say 0 0.951 meters is equal to y2 plus q squared divided by 2g a squared, where a is 2 meters wide and y2 is the depth. So you'll notice that the width of the channel has changed. So the b that I'm using here at the downstream location isn't the same 2.5 meters wide. So now the width is less than it was before. Um, so we can substitute in the uh, known Q squared, 2.25 cubic meters per second, and we square that, and then 2G, so that's 2 times 9.81 meters per second squared. And uh, so it's 0 0.951 is equal to y2 plus 0 0.06451 divided by y2 squared. So if we just look at 2 times 9.81 times 2 squared, so it's times 4, that's in the denominator and we're dividing that by that is being divided by 2.25 squared. We're working towards setting up our cubic equation. And the cubic equation is going to be y2 cubed minus 0 0.951 y2 squared plus 0 0.06451 is equal to 0. So the roots. It's going to be this negative root of 0 0.2334, 0 0.3197, and 0 0.865. And uh, we can know which one to choose by trying to diagnose the uh, flow regime upstream, asking the question, well, were the conditions supercritical or were they subcritical initially? And uh, there's a couple of different ways we can do that. Well, one is that we've already calculated the critical depth. And we found that the critical depth was 0.4, uh, 0.436. The initial depth at 1 was 0.9. And so since y1 is greater than yc, that means that the flow conditions at 1 initially were subcritical. 
which means that we should select the, uh, the deeper root, the subcritical root. Um, we can double check that by just calculating the fraud number. So the fraud number being less than one shows us that we have subcritical conditions. So either one of those is sufficient, either the comparison of Y1 to YC or calculating the fraud number. Either one tells us that of these three roots, we should choose 0.865. So that's a little counterintuitive. If we go back to this initial sketch, what we had was the water was flowing at a depth of 0.9 meters. And we put in these piers. And remember, what I suggested was that most people would kind of react that that's going to cause the water level to rise. But it didn't. The water level fell. Uh, what we saw was that it went from 0.9 meters, and then the new flow depth is going to be 0.865. So the channel went from 2.5 meters wide down to 2 meters wide. So we made the, the channel quite a bit narrower, and that caused the water level to fall. We'll go into more detail about why that happened. I mean, this is just a, a calculation that illustrates that it does. And we apply many of the same processes that we did before. It's just that you look at specific energy at 1, and you equate it to the specific energy at 2, and you solve for the new depth. Any questions about this example? All right. Um, so I'm going to get through your uh, submissions for water gems. And uh, this stuff that we're working on now ties into the homework assignment that's due on Tuesday after spring break. So you maybe want to get an early look at that and just see if you can apply some of what you learned already to solving those problems. I'll see you on Thursday. <laughs>